Hi. We are the cast of the politician. And we're in the studio with the Hollywood Reporter. <laughs> I feel like after binging the entire series in two days, like I'm best friends with all your characters. I also feel like I go to St. Sebastian High and I'm ready to cast my ballot. Um, but Better be how, for Peyton, yeah, but sorry, keep going. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, don't, I think it would be for Peyton, actually. I would. Um, oh, oh, snap. Oh, <laughs> no. I, I, I've, I've thought about this. No, it's fine. I, I, I love Astrid, and I love that she's an HBIC, but I feel like if she got the presidency, she'd be like, thank you, next, and just kind of move on to the next thing. I feel like yeah. Peyton would be really engaged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but this uh, experience of high school that we see on The Politician, it's so singular and specific and wild. How did your own high school experiences compare? Are, are any of you, were any of you like your actual characters in high school? <laughs> No, yeah, absolutely. I was, I, absolutely not. If I was my character, I would be suspended. So, <laughs> at least, expelled. At the very least. Or expelled. Arrested. Or in jail? <laughs> yep, you got it. Yep, so I was not like that. <laughs> I went to a super intense prep school in, in Los Angeles that's called Harvard Westlake that's like super uh, academic and very uh, competitive so there was like seeds of the experience were similar and a lot of the ambition is similar except for me it was a lot more in like sports and in like the arts because it was a, a, a lot of children of Hollywood go there like a lot of entertainment families so like everyone takes the, the, the shows and the group the, like improv groups and the scene stu like studies and all that very seriously and everybody has designs past high school the way that a lot of these characters do okay so I think that that similar in that way but certainly not as aesthetically pleasing yeah for, yeah the show is beautiful mm -hmm. from the clothes to the houses I'm just like in awe in every single scene mm -hmm. agreed <laughs> um, now uh, I want to talk about that intro first of all um, Chicago by Sufjan Stevens just like gives me full body chills every oh, single time yeah. um, but I feel like there are lots Lots of Easter eggs I should be looking out for within the intro. But one thing I did notice is there are books being filed away with past presidents. There's like Reagan and Clinton and Obama, and then there's a book called The Idiot's Guide to Clowning. <laughs> Can you guys um, share some insight on that? And I, I was wondering maybe if it's a substitute book for someone else. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think you should follow your instinct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Up for interpretation. Yes. <laughs> Ben, your character, Peyton, he is not afraid to sort of roll around in the mud to get what he wants. But even though he has this like really intense ambition, I feel like he's genuine when he says he wants to make the world a better place. Who are Peyton's political icons? Like, did you think about that as you were shaping your character? Um, certainly. I, I was less inclined to pick particular politicians and more so just anyone who is really... Um, adept at creating like an, a digestible version of themselves, like a character of themselves that people can immediately find very trustworthy. Uh, so certainly a number of politicians, uh, I think Ra he loves Reagan for sure. Like he says in the first scene of, of the series, he, he thinks the modern presidency began with Reagan because Reagan really focused on the television character that he was in order to become the president rather than the specifics and like the, getting mired in the policy and things that I think unfortunately people don't digest well. It's more about sort of what's your first impression of someone and can you trust them and do you want to hang out with them? The show kind of seems like an allegory for what's going on in our current political climate. How do you think it impacted the narrative of this show? Pretty heavily, mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, I think the, right? I mean, the things that even Peyton addresses in his speeches, for example, the speech on gun control, that is all authentic statistics and such. And I think because that is such a prevalent topic that is being discussed right now, of course you would choose that. And of course, especially when you get the opportunity to discuss it from the point of view of these young people in the high schools um, where these rules and laws would be implemented, it's, yeah, incredibly topical and important. And I think, yeah, Ryan, Brad and Ian always have their finger on that pulse. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, like you said, the show really does cover a lot of topical issues from gun control to voter fraud to mental health and, and suicide and all these things. And I feel like the show is going to probably get kids more excited about being politically active, especially as, yeah, we, can only hope. Yeah, as we gear up for the 2020 election. So what do you hope the takeaway is for kids who might be turning 18 this year or next year? I mean, I hope it starts a discussion. I think, like, the show in itself is a discussion, and, you know, the characters are constantly pushing and pulling, and I just, I hope that more young people are interested and want to talk about it and, um, 
want to share their point of view without judgment because it's a show on Netflix and people are watching it and it's exciting and there are young people like them on the show, you know, like we're high schoolers. I just, I hope a discussion more than anything. I think that high schoolers today are so acutely aware of what is happening within mm -hmm. the political climate right now. And going back to your earlier question about what you know we were like in high school, I can't say that I was aware of mm -hmm. politics in any way. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to do with the times, with social media and everything being always in your face mm -hmm. and things being so dire right now mm -hmm. that you're constantly hearing things in the 24-hour the news cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this show being appealing to a younger audience mm -hmm. like that will be able to you know, heighten their sense and possibly get them even more involved than they already are. Mm. Mm. Um, someone very involved in Peyton's operation is, of course, your character, Julia Alice. Yeah. I feel like his dreams would mean nothing without his first lady to be. Um, and I kind of get like a Hillary Clinton vibe in the mm -hmm. way that you're just always there for your man, no matter what, you, you're always sticking by his side. Yeah. What first ladies or political figures went into your character? Hillary Clinton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of young Hillary Clinton. That's how the character was described to me when I first got the audition. And I just dug in and watched as many interviews of her when um, Bill Clinton was the president and with the scandal and how she stood by him and in what way. And I tried to study what that drive was to stand by him, even you know, when things get sticky. Um, so yeah, a young Hillary Clinton. And then I looked at an array of different first ladies as much as I could, just, I wanted to take in as much as I could from, you know, all of them. <laughs> just because, you know, like, it's a very specific role. And um, yeah, I just wanted to absorb as much as I could and take in different aspects of different people. Nancy Reagan I looked at as well, mm -hmm. because Reagan is mentioned a lot. and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. What I love about any great Ryan Murphy production is how inclusive he is with mm -hmm. the different sorts of voices represented in the series. I feel like even among this cast um, and, and the characters in the show, there's different gender identities and ethnic backgrounds and sexualities. Um, for Theo and Ronnie, mm -hmm. this being one of your first big high profile acting gigs, how would you describe the significance of that on this series? Which I think, I mean, for me, um, I didn't see myself on screen until I saw Lena Waithe in Master of None. Um, not to say that there weren't any, you know, lesbians on screen, um, but a, a black lesbian who um, presented herself in a more masculine way. So that was the first time I thought that Hollywood would be open to someone that looked like me, and that was really important. Um, but not only that, to play a character where, and then, in all sexualities on the show and the spectrum of that, um, it just is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Um, like a like an ideal world where it's just people can be free in who they are. And I think that's what you were speaking to, but it was unbelievably important. And not only that, to be in a cast that is has been nothing but, you know, um, consistent allies, which is phenomenal. So Yeah. I think that my first like TV role getting to be something that is not like specifically about being trans is like kind of revolutionary. Like totally. I mm -hmm. always feel like I am having to, I don't know, like present some part of myself to try to get a job. And like mm -hmm. I've constantly faced issues with like casting where they're always like, have you had this surgery or have you done this or have you done this? And it like, and like they won't, it, it, stories have been so focused on the body and the specific point in somebody's transition that like I've had people not want to work with me because I had top surgery and that's like ridiculous like um, and it's so upsetting uh, but here I think because I'm so used to having to deal with that with with content that I was a little scared at first I was like that there were no labels I was like you know am I representing my community well because it's not specifically about gender identity um, and then I was talking to Janet Mock actually who directed one of the episodes and I was like is this weird and she was like no like this is it like embrace this like you just get to you know be like a cunning little nerd and that's <laughs> it like I never thought I would be able to do that um, and I love doing content that is more specifically connected to gender identity but like I'm like getting cast in the show is kind of like, oh, is this how cisgender people feel? Like they just get to play a character and it's not like about like, 
this is who I am or coming out or something like that, which is important. But, um, but yeah, it's, it feels like a big step forward that I kind of just get to be a person. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. Um, Laura, this is a, re a reunion on multiple levels for you. You worked with Ben and Dear Evan Hansen, and then you also uh, did Glee with Ian and Ryan and yeah. Brad. What was it like reuniting with everyone from like two different projects, and how is this role specifically different than those other projects? Um, I mean, it was amazing to reunite with Ryan and Ian and Brad. They're just such amazing creators, and I, it really was such a, it's like the highest form of compliments to be asked back to work with them. <laughs> um, and, you know, reuniting with Ben has had its trials and tribulations. Um, so we're, we're working on it. <laughs> That's why I'm put in between them. I have to <laughs> stop fighting everyone, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> it's honestly, it's like, hey, I couldn't have, like, I, I couldn't have dreamt something this amazing. I mean, just being with like this amazing human that I've known for so long now and have worked with for so long. And there's just this level of amazing trust and, and companionship and having him on set has just been so calming because this is such a huge project for both of us. And so to be able to be there for one another and to know like you can look across the room and like make eye contact with someone that you know so well and, and trust. And so that's been such a gift. And um, it's also just been so amazing to like watch him get into this character and it's so different from what we were doing on Broadway and and that is really thrilling and yeah and this character is just so like wacky and fun and like ruthless and there's so many layers to everything that we're doing so it's fun it's fun to be not crying eight times a week <laughs> as well yeah. all right Zoe we have got to talk about Infinity Jackson. Yeah, we have to Jackson. talk. Right. First of all, let's, <laughs> let's, talk, about let's talk about her name. Like, her full yeah. name is Infinity Maybelline Jackson. Yeah, she's, her middle <laughs> name is Maybelline because um, my dog's name is Maybelline, just so we're clear. Yeah. Oh my god, that's adorable. Oh. I just remembered that. Oh, I didn't god. even realize that till right now. Yeah, I didn't either. Well, we needed it. We needed a middle name, and, and he was like, what, man, a Mabel, 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 Maybelline, and then that's how it happened. So that's her, amazing. Her, my dream is that she has. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe she is. But wow. she wasn't. <laughs> that has a lot of repercussions. That, that maybe she's My secret dream is that uh, <laughs> I, I want Infinity to have a sister named like Eternity covered in all That would be From your words to <laughs> Brian Murphy's ears. Hopefully. Um, but so, so she's obviously obviously impacted by Munchausen by proxy syndrome, which we've seen in several TV projects uh, inspired by uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard. So I'm wondering. How much of Gypsy was in your character, and what do you think she would think of your interpretation? It isn't an interpretation of Gypsy Rose. It's okay. not. Um, I just like to reiterate that, similar to so many other topics and themes and discussions in the politician, like uh, voter suppression, um, gun control, uh, all the, the myriad of of um, things that are very or that are discussed a lot right now, Munchausen by proxy these characters, Dusty and Infinity, are fictional in a fictional world. Um, so I hope she does not watch it and, 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 <laughs> and see, think that this is an interpretation because it by no means is. Yeah. And then uh, Lucy, your character, Astrid, as yeah. we were talking about earlier, she is the definition of HBIC. So I'm wondering what real life or fictional HBICs or Mean Girls went into inspiring your performance? Because I, I do kind of get like a Reese Witherspoon in the election vibe. Risky question. Um, yeah, I think that one was, Tracy Flick was brought up a lot in the kind of early days. But then I think, I don't know, I, I usually want to anchor my character in some thing, someone, someones. Um, but with Astrid, I think it was because you see so many different versions of her throughout the series. It wasn't so much that. It very much lived on the page and then between in discussions with Ryan, Brad, and Ian and whoever was directing each episode. Um, but I think what's interesting with her is that you get to, I don't know, look at the person behind the behavior, which is something that I think Ryan and Brad's shows always encourage. Don't just immediately buy the facade. And especially with Astrid, I think we've all kind of come across that kind of behavior. And it is just kind of what your mom told you. It comes from unhappiness and some kind of, yeah, something inwards in yourself. So it was really interesting to kind of uproot Astrid and see what in her own life caused that behavior and caused her to feel like she had to put her power in those places, which is sometimes in that kind of unnecessary unnecessary cruelty. 
Um, so it's kind of really interesting unpicking that, and of course you see Astrid recognize that as well. And then lastly, of course, we have this incredible main cast, but there are so many legends on the show. I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow oh. is playing your mom. We have Judith Light and Bette Midler uh, coming in at the end. What was it like working with these icons? Did you learn anything? Is there something new that you learned about them personally or just about acting? Like, what, what was it like? So much star power. Very overwhelming. I mean, I can speak to, to Gwyneth because a lot of our stuff is, is, is the two of us, I think. You know, like much of the world, I had a very larger than life image of Gwyneth. She's like Margot Tenenbaum. She's like mm -hmm. Goop. She's, you know, all these things. And certainly, <laughs> she, you know, certainly she is, and she has that elegance and that power. But to get to connect with her on an intimate level and see how sort of warm she is and how immediately maternal and protective she became towards me and how she really tried to connect with me and make those moments between Peyton and his mother feel as sort of lived in and honest as possible, which I think was really important to the greater scheme of the show was really wonderful and such a treat. And she's a master multitasker, in this, which is very inspiring to me. Someone who's trying to do multiple things at the same time for the first time really in my life. Uh, she can you know, be making really important decisions while camera, camera setups are changing with her team and then come in and be entirely present with me in a scene. And that is very inspiring to me. Um, Obviously, Zoe can speak to Jessica, and, and the only one that's really worked with Bet so far is, yeah. is Laura. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was epic. I mean, just her energy when she walks into the room, everybody like stops what they're doing and just stands a little straighter and <laughs> stops breathing a little. Um, <laughs> but no, it's really like it's incredible just to witness the confidence that these women have and to really, um, I, I look up to that a lot because it, it you can really affect a room and you can make people feel a certain way and they just choose to own their power and their presence and um, and that's a really special thing to witness yeah mm -hmm. it's really cool Zoe what was it like eating so much pasta with Jessica Lane <laughs> <laughs> that's like my dream situation by the way Eat, like yes. going to Olive, Olive Garden with it's Jessica honestly Lane. Zoe yeah. too I feel like no <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's why I did it I that was not part of, yeah um, <laughs> I was really hungry that day, so yeah. I just went for it, <laughs> and then I threw up. <laughs> anyway, um, I did, I threw up. Um, but that was the breadsticks, I think, and they were really, they were not good or not, warm. Not fresh. <laughs> nope. <laughs> good or warm. But on a better note than that, uh, Jessica is as um, magical as I um, expected her to be, and the thing that I didn't know or expect was how funny she is. Mm -hmm to the point of uncontrollable <laughs> laughter, to the point where scenes didn't make it in the show because there were certain people that couldn't stop laughing. Wow, the shade. Are <laughs> you talking about those bologna cups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, <laughs> she's a, she's, she is a dream, truly, so yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up, guys. Thank you so much for Thank chatting. You. Thank you. Y'all can catch more of this stellar cast on The Politician, season one streaming now on Netflix.